Hi, everyone, and welcome to 3GNY's Stories Live, We Do Wednesday. Thanks for joining us tonight. <clears throat> I'm David Wax, 3GNY president and grandchild of two Holocaust survivors. I'm thrilled to be here for the 14th We Do Wednesday. Tonight, we'll be featuring guest speaker, Stacey Delicat, who has a fascinating story to share. We welcome all of you who are tuning in for the first time, as well as those of you who regularly participate in our programs. We are grateful for our community. 3GNY is an educational nonprofit for grandchildren of Holocaust survivors <clears throat> and our supporters. As a living link, we preserve the legacies and the lessons of the Holocaust. Our mission is to educate diverse communities about the perils of intolerance and to provide a supportive forum for the descents of survivors. Founded in 2005 with a group of six, 3GNY's membership is now at 4,500 and continues to grow. Over these past 15 years, we've held diverse programs of all sizes around New York area. 3G New York has also played a leading role in launching other 3G groups, including 3G DC and 3G New Jersey. And we're in conversations with others around the country to expand our reach. Tonight's We Do Wednesday program showcases 3G NY's flagship educational initiative, We Do, which is short for We Educate. This four week training program empowers grandchildren of survivors to learn and compellingly share their family's Holocaust experiences in school classrooms with and with community groups. We've all seen the heartbreaking studies stating that lack of Holocaust knowledge among recent high school uh, and college graduates. The good news is that students who do receive Holocaust education are more tolerant and comfortable with people of different races and backgrounds. They are more willing to challenge incorrect or biased information and are more likely to be upstanders. Through our grandparents' testimony, we talk about the importance of stepping in early and often where small injustices are found, on the playground, in the classroom, and on the street, because it is the easiest and most efficient way to act. By the time Nazi tanks roll in, it's too late. 3GNY has trained over 300 speakers in New York, New Jersey, Washington, DC, and most recently around the country on Zoom since the pandemic hit. In 2020 alone, we trained 62 grandchildren, more speakers than any other year by far. Also in 2020, between speaking in schools, our live programming and our YouTube channel have more than 10,000 people uh, have, have watched us. And in total, through WeDo's existence, more than 3,000 students have been impacted. Hope is not lost and we need to keep doing the work. You can help us accomplish this through a financial gift of any amount. This will go directly toward training more speakers, thus reaching even more students. We do not solicit donations from schools, teachers, or students. We provide our program team, programming to schools completely free, and we aim to keep the cost of training to 3Gs as low as possible. There is a link with ways to donate in the chat, and we hope you'll consider making a gift. If you've already donated to us, thank you so much. And to everyone, by just being here tonight, you're helping us honor the memories of our grandparents and ensuring that never again is more than just an empty phrase. I'd now like to introduce a special guest in advance of Stacy's presentation, who will speak briefly about our collaborations with 3Gs in Florida. Julie Pereski is a leader in Miami and will share a few words with us before introducing Stacy, who is her cousin. Julie, thanks so much for being here tonight and for sharing this sacred response responsibility with us. You're on you're on mute state, Julie. Sorry. <laughs> Let me try that again. Sorry. Thank you, David. And thank you so much for inviting me to be here tonight. I am the granddaughter of two Holocaust survivors. And with the inspiration of the incredible work being done by 3GNY and we do, I am also the co-founder of 3G Miami. It was a real COVID silver lining when the New York-based We Do training program switched to a virtual platform last April and I had the opportunity to participate. I've always felt the importance of continuing to honor and share the testimonies and stories of my grandparents and other survivors so that we never forget and that the horrors of the Holocaust never again happen to any group of people. If you or anyone you know might be interested in working with us in Miami, please email me. I am so honored to introduce tonight's speaker, my amazing cousin, 
Stacy Delacat. Stacy joined 3GNY in 2015 and has been sharing our grandparents' stories with students through the We Do initiative for many years. Tonight, Stacy will share the story and testimony of a charismatic, strong, and kind-hearted man, our grandfather, Otto Delacat. Otto was one of the longest surviving prisoners of the Nazis. He survived solitary confinement in prison, work camps, and five different concentration camps. Through all of the horrors and losses that our grandpa Otto endured, our family was very blessed that his spirit prevailed and that his children, grandchildren, and four great-grandchildren had the fortune to enjoy him for so many wonderful years. So let me share a little more about our speaker tonight. From a young age, it was clear that Stacy was a rising star. She frequently led on-air broadcasts in her living room when we visited. Many times, the audience were her dolls and stuffed animals that attentively sat in a row as they received the evening news. It was clear that Stacy was destined for on-air success. And she rose quickly from her playroom to prime time. Stacy is an Emmy award-winning journalist. She reports for Fox 5 New York, where among other things, she has covered the COVID-19 pandemic, the presidential election, Hurricane Sandy, and climate change. With her communications degree from Cornell and a master's in broadcasting from Northwestern, she launched her career on the assignment desk of CNN's New York office. She is also a successful real estate agent with Houlihan Lawrence in Greenwich, Connecticut. Stacy lives in Riverside, Connecticut with her husband and two beautiful young ch children who I miss dearly. We are in for a wonderful experience tonight. And now it is my great pleasure to turn it over to you, Stacy. Thank you, Julie. I'm so touched by your kind words and it's such a treat to have family uh, introducing me. So I appreciate everything you said. That was a great introduction. And I just wanna say that I'm proud of you too for your efforts because a few years ago, Julie and I talked about how there was no organization like 3G in Miami, really in Florida. Uh, we reached out to the people from 3G New York and at the time there was nothing going on. And, and now a couple of years later, you're finally bringing this to reality down there. So congratulations on getting that off the ground because it's so important. Um, and, and thanks to everyone for joining tonight to hear our family's story. Friends, family, colleagues, people I haven't talked to in a long time who saw me promote this and said they were gonna sign up. It really means a lot that you care enough to hear about this. Now more than ever, it just feels so imperative to share uh, my grandparents' stories and remember them. My grandmother, bo both of Julia and my grandparents are Holocaust survivors who survived Auschwitz. My grandmother passed away in 2014. My grandpa, who I'll be talking about tonight at the end of 2018, and it feels like there are just fewer and fewer survivors left with the passing days. And so now it's up to us to be their voices. We're sadly in a time when incidents of anti-Semitism have skyrocketed. Hold that thought, I'm gonna just share my screen. Okay, here we are. We're sadly in a time when incidents of anti-Semitism have skyrocketed. And when, and when just four weeks ago today, we saw fellow Americans mounting a siege on the United States Capitol wearing sweatshirts, uh, here, here I am with my grandparents, that said Camp Auschwitz and 6MWE, 6 million wasn't enough. I actually spoke to a couple of Holocaust survivors about seeing these images. And one of them told me she was most upset that she felt like no one even really took notice. There was outrage maybe that day and the next day online and in the papers, but everyone's already moved on. It's as if this is not making any impression. Before I get started on my grandpa's amazing story of survival, I want to share some of his words from back in 2015. We had taken him, my family had taken him on a trip back to Vienna where he was born. We walked the streets where he grew up. We visited his parents' grave sites. We visited the local Holocaust memorials. And towards the end of our trip, I asked him to reflect. And I wanna play some of his words now because I just think it's very relative to the time that we're in. How important is it to remember what happened in the show of what people like you and grandma went through? Well, it's uh, most important it has happened to us and it 
happens again now in different parts of the world, different religions, political reason, persecution hasn't ended. We have not learned to live peacefully with all kind of uh, ethnic and political peoples. Nothing has changed really. We have we don't we have not learned from the experience of Hitler's Germany. Well, it's hard to hear that, but it's my hope by sharing this story and by the other three G's sharing their family stories that uh, one day people will learn. We will remember and not repeat history. Well, as you heard Julie say, uh, my grandpa Otto was once described as one of the longest surviving prisoners of the Nazis. He was born in Vienna in October of 1922. This map actually charts out his path. Uh, you can see Vienna there. He would go on to survive a labor camp, prison, and then five concentration camps before finally being liberated in 1945. He credits luck for 99.1% of the reason he made it out alive. And he says the other nine tenths of a percent were hope that he held on to, just hope that he would just make it to see another day. Otto was the third of four children. He had an older brother, Robert, an older sister, Edith, and eventually a younger sister, Vera. His family was poor and they lived in a one bedroom apartment. At one point, two of the kids actually went to live with grandparents in what was then Czechoslovakia because the quarters were so tight. When he was just five, his mother passed away in childbirth while in labor, that fifth child also didn't survive. And because his father had to work and couldn't take care of these kids alone, my grandpa ended up bouncing around to some foster homes and an orphanage. But when he was about 10, his father, David, remarried a non-Jewish woman, Aurelia, who's the woman pictured here, and the family reunited and lived together until about 1938. By then, Hitler had been in power in Germany for several years and his political influence was really beginning to be felt in Austria. My grandfather's father, David, in the picture here, lost his relatively stable factory job because he was Jewish. My grandpa had been working in a store, but the Nazis destroyed that store as they did others run by Jews and took it over to run as their own. So my grandpa ended up going to Germany to work on a farm so he could send food and money back to the rest of his family. This is a picture of him in 1939. He worked for a family that didn't know he was Jewish. They didn't ask. And at that time, he didn't really look Jewish. He had fair hair. He had blue eyes. And so he could pass. He was 17 in this picture. And shortly after this, his life, his life would really begin to change. After working on a farm for about a year, an experience he remembered favorably, uh, the war with Poland started and the Nazis began to go around Germany organizing young people to be part of Hitler's youth. Well, you needed papers to prove you were Aryan or of non-Jewish descent, which my grandpa didn't have, not that he wanted to join Hitler's youth, but he had to flee because he didn't have papers to prove he wasn't Jewish. So he went back to Austria. He went home and reunited with his father, who was working in a labor camp in the southern part of the country. Now, by then, in major cities like Vienna, throughout Germany and Eastern Europe, Jews were forced to wear a yellow star. I'm sure many of you have seen in textbooks or in exhibits and in movies, the yellow star that said Jude or Jew. But the labor camp my grandpa was working in was in a small town and they didn't require that. So he was a teenager. And as I said, he didn't look particularly Jewish. So he did what teens did. He and his friends would sneak around and they ended up going to the movies. He wasn't supposed to go to the movies, but that's where he got caught. He was arrested, tried and convicted and sent to prison where he spent a year in solitary confinement, all because he was Jewish and Jews were banned from going to the movies. When he got out, he was put on a train and shipped to Flossenburg, a concentration camp in Northern Germany. This was late 1941 and he was 19 years old. Flossenburg was a harsh camp. As you can see in this photo, it was built up on a hill in a stone quarry and all the Jews were forced to carry heavy stones up and down the steep hill. My grandpa always said he didn't believe there was any actual purpose for this, but just to weigh the Jews down and kill them. And in fact, many of the other Jewish prisoners there, they didn't make it long because a lot of them came from Czechoslovakia, from wealthier backgrounds, they were not, used to this, to, to these sort of conditions. It was such a shock. They were so physically and mentally devastated by life in the camps that many of them actually ran into the electric fence surrounding Flossenburg to kill themselves, or they got shot trying to do that. My grandpa was there for about a year. In October 1942, he was shipped to Poland to the infamous concentration camp known as Auschwitz. He was a good worker and by then he had been a prisoner in some form or another for almost three years and so he'd become pretty hardened by it. 
He was chosen to work on a particular labor squad in Auschwitz, which turned out to be both one of the worst experiences of all of his times in the camps, but also one that helped him sur to survive. I wanna talk a little bit about the cattle cars that took Jews to concentration camps like Auschwitz. I'm sure most of you have seen pictures of the cattle cars. Perhaps some of you in the New York area even saw the one that's been on loan to the uh, Museum of Jewish Heritage in Lower Manhattan. It's still outside the museum. This is a photo of one, uh, a real one that I took when I visited Auschwitz a few years ago. Uh, it's hard to imagine traveling on one of these. If you think back to pre-pandemic times, if you live in New York, you think about riding a rush, a packed rush hour train. And then think about a hot day. There's always those times in New York when you get a car that didn't have air conditioning. It's not, the AC is not working. You're pressed up against people. You've got someone's backpack in your, in your face and someone else's hair on your shoulder. And now imagine though that that train car is made of wooden slats. There's no electricity, no windows. And you're stuck on that train for three or four days with your family and dozens of strangers. And you have no idea where you're being taken. Sick people, old people, babies, everyone piled in with no food, no proper toilet. Everyone's either sitting on the floor or standing because there was no room to lie down. That is what being transported on these cattle cars was like. Now, my grandpa actually considers himself fortunate because he was never transported on a car like that with his family into the terrifying unknown. But when he got to Auschwitz, the labor squad he was assigned to was tasked with taking the passengers off the train when they arrived at the neighboring Camp Birkenau, and they would take their suitcases from them. You can see in this photo amongst these people getting off the train, uh, a couple of prisoners in striped suits. And who knows, perhaps one of these people in the photos in the museum may, may even have been him. Uh, my grandpa's job, the others in his squad, their job was to take the suitcases from the Jews and then the Nazis would signal people to either go to the left or the right, to the gas chambers, the other way to the camps. I'm gonna let him describe this experience in his own words. We came there, the train was already there and the SS was lined up on the perimeter with dogs and with machine guns and everything. And as soon as we arrived, they would open up the doors and we had to, help those to transport the Jews out of the wagons. Uh, this I would consider uh, one of my worst experiences. Looking from the outside into the, the wagon, even though I never came with a transport like that, and I realized then and now that this was the worst experience that could happen to a Jewish family when they were in those cattle cars for three, four days. And when you open up this, those cars, it didn't look like uh, human beings were in there. It looked like garbage, you know, and so they came out sick and smelly and everything. If a woman was with young children and she kept the young children, she would never make it into the camp. She would make it automatically to the gas chambers in the crematoria. And uh, often we tried to tell them in Yiddish or whatever the language was, but it was uh, very rarely that a mother uh, would listen and leave the child go by itself or leave it go with the with the grandmother and so on. So that was one of the problems we encountered uh, besides this uh, unbelievable uh, stench and everything and the, the people crying and yelling and then line finally yelling up and putting into a line of being selected. This, you see, this is the problem that bothers me up to today. Seeing all this was very hard in the beginning, but when you see it for days in, days out, for months, even the people dying in Birkenau in, in the barracks by the hundreds of being piled out outside and then put on those flat cars and put, put brought to the crematoria, somehow takes away your humanity, you know? It's like they say, if you live among garbage, you think it's a normal condition. If you live along that, I guess uh, it's the same thing. And the other thing was, uh, I think, uh, speaking for myself, the only way you could survive in this kind of environment was if you were able to make up your mind, if you cannot change what happens, you have to try to live it as good as you can and live for the moment. You couldn't plan, oh, when I get out, I'm going to do this and that because you don't know if you're going to get out. But if you said, today I live, today I eat, we'll see what's going to happen tomorrow. I think that was one of the ways to survive.
and having 99 or 9% tenth percent luck you have that little one tenth of a hundredth of a percent to to want to survive for the next day and see what happens i think that made all the difference well, that video was filmed by Steven Spielberg's crew in 1995 for the Showa Project. Now, my grandpa didn't have a choice about being on that labor squad, which was called Canada, actually, which unloaded the prisoners, the, the passengers from the cattle cars. You either did what you told or you, were, you would face death. But the thing about being on that uh, particular labor squad, which met the trains, was he, he had to sort through the luggage. It was difficult because people had stuffed their most valuable possessions into their one bag. It's like you always get that question, what would you take with you if you could only take a few things to a desert island, right? Well, people took their valuables. They took family heirlooms, photographs, jewelry, sometimes some money. Uh, they, they, the Jews, you know, they were desperate. They didn't know what fate they would be facing. And someone in an act of desperation even put a baby in their suitcase. My grandpa said, unfortunately, by the time he and the other prisoners opened that bag, the baby was dead. It's hard to imagine how, how desperate a person would be to put their baby in a suitcase thinking that was the only chance it had at surviving. But he would also find a piece of food, maybe a piece of cheese here, some sausage there, and keep in mind, meals at Auschwitz were pretty much non-existent. They, they consisted of watery soup, maybe watery coffee, uh, a potato, a piece of bread. My grandmother, who I mentioned, also survived Auschwitz, said that the, the bread was like a hard piece of brown clay that you got. And so the hunger was often unbearable. Whatever little food my grandpa could get when he go, went through these bags would help him make it through. One day, he found a piece of salami and he hid it at his uniform. But as he was going back to his barracks at the end of the day, he was searched and an SS guard found him with the piece of food. Now, rather than beat him right there on the spot, the protocol was to take down the prisoner's numbers. Uh, another shot of the labor squad he was on and going through the luggage. Uh, what the Nazis did was write down the Jews' numbers. As you know, and this is unfortunately not a great photo, the quality is not great. Most of the Jews, many of the Jews at Auschwitz, Birkenau and other camps had numbers tattooed on the, their arms. And these numbers were not tattooed by professional tattoo artists. They were other Jews who were tasked with doing the tattoos. And so when my grandfather had uh, his number, tattooed, it was 69840, um, but it was done a little sloppily. But when he got caught with this piece of salami, rather than punishing him right on the spot, as I said, they wrote down his number. The, the protocol was then the next morning at lineup to call the numbers of those prisoners who were to be beaten or even taken to the gas chamber. So again, really hard to make out in this particular photo. His number was 69840. If you can picture that, the eight uh, when it was tattooed, one end of the eight was open. And so it, it kind of looked more like a three. So the guard had apparently written his number down 69340 instead of 840. So the next morning when they stood calling his number, it was actually the wrong number and he was able to escape punishment or perhaps even death. And luckily no one else had that number either. One instance of luck that helped him to survive. And there are other instances when he says sheer luck was the difference between life and death. My grandfather was in Auschwitz and Birkenau for about a year, but in 1943, he was sent to a labor camp to take apart what had been the Warsaw Ghetto uh, in another part of Poland. The Nazis needed those raw construction materials. Again, my grandpa was a solid hard worker, so they sent some men on to deconstruct that camp. By 1944, the Russian army was advancing on Poland and the Nazis moved him and the other Jews back to Germany. But at that point, there weren't any available cattle cars. So they spent the first two days marching on foot. It was late summer and he says it was extremely hot. They had very little food, no bottles or anything to carry water in. About two days into the march under the scorching sun, the prisoners came across a river and they were so thirsty, so parched, that many of them started running toward it for a drink. He actually described it as some of them running like animals to the water. They were so thirsty. But the Nazi commanders marching alongside them thought the Jews were trying to run. So they immediately opened their machine guns and started shooting. Suddenly that cool, clear river turned into a sea of red blood. My grandpa said it was suddenly a miracle though because the guards all of a sudden realized that the prisoners weren't running. They were just going to get a sip of water and they stopped shooting. 
A few hundred people were killed that day, but again, by luck, my grandfather wasn't one of them. The survivors continued marching on for another day until finally a train did come to take them the rest of the way to the Dachau concentration camp. My grandpa would spend another seven or eight months in concentration camps until he was liberated by American soldiers in April of 1945. He was sent to live in a displaced persons camp where he met my grandmother and who had also, as I said, survived Auschwitz and another camp. They got married and had their first child, my aunt Julie's mom, before immigrating to the United States in the late 1940s. And here uh, is some paperwork that Julie amazingly dug up uh, of the forms my grandpa had when he came to the United States. They first stayed with relatives in the Bronx, then got their own apartment in Brooklyn and eventually settled on Oceanside, Long Island, in Oceanside on Long Island. Now, my grandpa never shied away from speaking about what he lived through. In fact, he was insistent about telling his story to whoever would listen. He was extremely involved in the Jewish community in Oceanside. He spoke to Hebrew schools. He spoke to schools. He spoke at Holocaust remembrance ceremonies because he really believed that it was imperative for people to know what happened so history would not get repeated. And my family always says from the ashes of Auschwitz rose uh, they're, they're my grandparents uh, at their house in Oceanside, Long Island. My family always says, from the ashes of Auschwitz rose three beautiful generations of family. And here you can see in these photos um, from probably 10 years ago, my grandparents sitting in the middle and Julie and her family and her kids and me and my family. Um, and they took so much pride in having such a big family here in planting their roots here. Um, I just want to, uh, and here he is with, with my son, Noah, who we got to meet, um, this was back in, in 2018. And I just wanna um, end with one other video that I took after my grandpa's 96th birthday when we all celebrated in Miami, and I had begun speaking to schools through the We Do program at that point. And I said to him, you know, I'm going to schools and I'm telling your story. What is it that you want me to share? What is it that you want the kids to remember when I go into the classrooms and talk about your story? And here's what he said. What I want to take him away is what I went through during Hitler's times in Germany and how I survived mentally and physically just by never giving up hope and hoping for a better day tomorrow. And I just want to close by saying that, you know, you heard him talk about hope several times, and I think it is a really powerful theme. Just last week, I did an interview with the president of the Museum of Jewish Heritage in New York City, and I was talking to him about, um, specifically about anti-Semitism, about those images I showed you, you know, people wearing these shirts with awful sayings at the Capitol and the fact that the museum, two days after the, the uprising at the Capitol, the museum in New York City had a Confederate flag tied to its uh, door, it, to the handle of its front door. And the president of the museum said to me, you know, the thing is though, we have to have hope. He said, whenever I talk to survivors, that's always one theme I hear is about hope. And if survivors could have hope after everything they went through, surely, we can have hope for a better day and to move past this. So I'm gonna end on that note and I wanna thank everyone again for tuning in tonight to hear about my grandpa's story, uh, to listen to my family's story. It really means a lot. And now I would be very happy to take any questions you might have. Well, first let's uh, stop the share. <laughs> you want me to do that? Yeah, can you stop the share? Maybe. Um, there we go. There we go. Okay, cool. Thank you so much, Stacy, uh, for gifting us with your family story. We are going to open it up for questions now. If you have a question for Stacy, please type it in using the Q and A button at the bottom middle of your screen. Uh, due to the high volume of questions we typically receive, we won't be able to answer every single one, but we'll try our best. And if questions are not addressed tonight, you can always email info at 3gnewyork.org and we will, you know, relay it to Stacy and get back to you um, as much as we can. So, Julie, you want to start it off with the first question here? Sure. So, Stacy, what's your experience been like speaking in schools? 
Well, um, it's been a great experience. And uh, in the last few years that I've done this, um, I've spoken at a couple of middle schools, a couple of high schools, most in the New York City area. Last year during COVID, I did one virtual talk to um, actually a Hebrew school. And it's been really powerful because as David said in the beginning of the presentation, there are some really horrific statistics out there about how many young people today, even not so young people, who don't even know what Auschwitz was, who don't even know, who think, oh, it was just 1 million or 3 million Jews that were killed in the Holocaust instead of 6 million. So it's really a privilege to be able to go in and tell a firsthand story. And I've had some very positive experiences. I mean, of course, these are kids and you're always gonna go into a classroom and not, you know, it's impossible to engage everyone. But sometimes the kids who you think are taking the least from it when you're standing up in the front of the classroom doing your presentation uh, and, end up being the ones who have the most questions or who are really touched by it. I've had experiences where kids have come up to me afterwards and asked for additional information. Someone said, I want to make sure I get the spelling of your grandpa's name right. I want to Google him, maybe put him in my presentation. So it's been really positive. And I will give a shout out to my friend and fellow 3G member, Dana Arshin, who's on the talk right now because she's the one who told me about this group years ago. I didn't know it existed. I originally joined and participated in some of the community and social events, but it was always most important to me to do the we do training to be able to speak in schools to be able to continue um what our grandpa always did and you know by then he was old and tired and no longer sharing the story so just uh there there's a there's many people saying thank you in the chat so uh thank you from judy rita peppy um i've all said thank you originally i'll, I'll get to the others when i get to it but um uh, next question is, do you know your grandmother's story and did she ever talk about it? Yes, and I wanted to say, by the way, that Julie could also chime in and answer some of these. So we do know my grandma Pearl's story. As I said, she also survived Auschwitz and she also she wanted to survive Dachau. Um, it's, it's interesting because I was actually doing some last minute Googling today. We, we do have the videotapes that both of them did for the show project digitized. Thanks to my brother who hopefully is watching as well, who, who digitized this a few years ago. So I've heard her whole account. I actually online today found some audio recordings that she had done as well. And what we know is she was born in Seget, which was then Ramon, R Romania. We always knew she was from the same town as Ili Wiesel, but listening to the recordings today, she said she actually lived on the same street as him. Perhaps her family was even on the same transport that went from the ghetto where they moved people from Seaget to Auschwitz. My grandma was one of those people whose families were crowded onto the cattle cars who had a horrific experience, the terrifying three days of transport. When she got to Auschwitz, her mother was sent almost immediately to her death. Her father ended up being killed and she later learned that her brother who had been sent to Bergen-Belsen um, was shot dead one day. She learned after the liberation. Um, she survived Auschwitz with two of her sisters and had two other sisters who uh, had survived have been able to escape as well. And it's interesting because in doing this training, you know, we're sort of encouraged to focus on one story, especially when talking to young people uh, and just sort of put all that detail, you know, you only maybe have 20, 30 minutes at most, but um, she also has an extremely compelling story. And so I think um, in the next few months, I'm gonna get together a presentation about her story and start sharing that when I do presentations. Thank you, Stacy. Another question here, how has your family's experience impacted your professional work? Um, that's a, a, an interesting question. I, I am a reporter for Fox 5. I've previously reported for other stations as well. And obviously as journalists, we are always supposed to be objective and not bring our personal lives into things. And I'm always cognizant of that. At the same time, this is part of my identity. And so I've certainly never shied away from covering anything that had to do with the Holocaust. Um, and certainly I've sought out stories as well. Just last week did a report for International Holocaust Remembrance Day, talking to survivors about how they were feeling in the current climate. Um, but I think in addition to just covering Holocaust matters, it's really important as a journalist to also cover anti-Semitism. I mean, Actually, if you think about before COVID took over our lives, at least in the New York area, the huge rise in anti-Semitic attacks was one of the biggest stories. We had the attack in Jersey City, the Hanukkah attack in, in Muncie, in, in Rockland County, New York, when Jews were targeted. The ADL was reporting, reporting record numbers of anti-Semitic incidents. And so it's always been very important for me to shine a light on that as well. Um. 
Question is, by what means did your grandfather arrive at Auschwitz since he didn't arrive via cattle car? Whew, that's a good <laughs> question because he, he was on a train, I believe, and maybe Julie, you know the answer to this, he was on a train transport, but because he was transported from Flossenburg, that uh, camp basically was being dissolved. There were very few survivors of Flossenburg. I believe they were sent on kind of like a more of a traditional rail transport. Julie, do you know that? I, th I do. Th I think that's what I've read or just uncovered in the videos as well. Okay. So we have Wanna another. Next one, Julie. Sure. Um, so there's a thank you at the beginning of this question and thank you for sharing. Do you know what happened to the rest of your grandfather's family during the Holocaust? So um, as I had mentioned, my grandfather's father had remarried a non-Jewish woman before the war, Aurelia. And we um, have some connections to this day to some of her family, which is really amazing. But um, because he was married to a non-Jewish woman, he managed to survive. He was not sent to camps. Um, that, that was how he managed to survive. One of his sisters, um, both of his sisters were killed in the camps and his brother had been able to escape actually uh, before the war. Here's the next one is, uh, did your grandfather ever mention Jews helping other Jews in a camp, even though Germans forbid this behavior? He did um, a little bit. And again, perhaps Julie wants to chime in. I mean, there are so many details of his story and I really isolated just very few nuggets of it. When my grandpa went on, I believe to, to Warsaw to Dachau, then even he had, he had friends who looked out for him or who would give him a heads up, who actually enabled him at, at one point to even communicate with the outside world. And so he certainly alluded to that. Um, you know, for the case of my grandmother, I mentioned she was with two of her sisters in Auschwitz and it was the sisters that really helped each other because my grandpa, my grandmother became very sick with typhoid while in the camps, uh, was very weak. You know, if the Nazis saw you were weak and sick, they would immediately kill you, but they managed to conceal her, or hide her under blankets at times, um, sneak extra food for her to try, try to help her regain her strength. So that's family helping family, maybe perhaps more expected, but, um, they, they both did allude to, to these instances. I can actually add to that just a little. Um, he always, I remember said like, you have to have one good friend. And there was always that important relationship when you're taking care of one another when they were sick or whatever the need was. And when he was part of that Canada commando that Stacy mentioned, he, many times Jews who were given these responsibilities to oversee other Jews doing work were very cruel and actually inflicted a lot of um, hardship on others. But he was always very kind and even handed. And I remember my grandmother sharing a story how after when they were in the displaced person camp, people came throwing themselves at his feet, thanking them and telling them that he really saved them. Um, unlike many of the other Jewish leaders of these groups at the time. So, um, you know. It was a notable part of his story. There's another question from your mom, actually. Have oh, the students wow. you have spoken to related their experiences with racism to anti-Semitism? Not directly. I mean, certainly that is a bridge that we hope and um, we think they'll 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 make. And I think with my story, when I was doing the training for We Do, I know one of the things that was talked about a lot, one of the things was sharing universal themes, right? Like um, just holding on to hope to make it to the best, you know, to the next day. And, and if there's nothing you can do about your circumstances, just sort of take every day the best you can. And so I sort of hope that there are pieces of the story that are relatable, whether, you know, you were in as drastic or extreme a situation as him, or just maybe also going through some other hard times. No one has you know, brought that up directly, but certainly it's, it's, it's a very relevant and, and, and applicable comparison. And, you know, perhaps they have those discussions in the classrooms afterwards with the teachers. Um, did your grandfather have any challenges acclimating to the US after his experiences? I 
You know, again, I'll ask Julie to chime in, but I, <laughs> I, I don't know if he did. This is one thing about our grandfather, and it's really interesting because the experience of my grandma Pearl versus Otto, they, you know, there seems to be sort of two different extremes of survivors, people who talk about it and make it their mission to share the story and they wanna make sure everyone knows what happens and the others who didn't wanna talk about it as much and still carried a lot of trauma around from that. My grandpa was one of the people who we spoke about his experience and maybe you could even see in the show a clip that, you know, you couldn't say, if I, what am I gonna do and I get out? You say, today I make it, if there's nothing, you know, what can you do? If there's nothing you can do, you live each way the, the best you can. And, and he, he was such a positive person that always looked on the bright side that I would imagine that if he did have some challenges, he probably didn't even see them as major challenges when he got here. He eventually became an electrician. He, he apprenticed for many years before opening his own successful business, which he had for several decades. And, you know, obviously, building up a life from coming here with absolutely nothing, um, starting a business, buying a home and so forth. Another question here, how did your grandparents connect and marry? So this is another one I want Julie to chime in on because you were just telling me some details you found out, but they met in the displaced, displaced persons camp in Germany after being liberated by the Americans. And I'm going to let you take it from there because I don't even know the details that well off the top of my head. They, well, there's, there's two conflicting pieces. We actually recently just had an article that was written all about his lineage in Germany and we just had it translated. And the way it was told in that article, which was recounted through a distant cousin um, from his mother's family actually, so he still lives in Austria, um, was that you know they met and two weeks later married in the displaced persons camp. So there's some discrepancy, was it two weeks or two months? But anyway, you know, I think finding life and, and starting life anew. And uh, my mother was quickly born thereafter. Um, and you know they wanted to look ahead and not look back. Here is uh, here is one. Uh, given the rise in anti-Semitism, have you ever experienced hostility or denial of the Holocaust from any of the communities you have spoken to? If so, how do you or would you address that? Not from any of the communities I've spoken to. Um, and to be honest, even in my somewhat public position. I personally have not received any messages. I guess I've been fortunate. I've never received any messages when I posted about something about the Holocaust of people saying, you know, the Holocaust didn't happen or you're a liar or anything like that. So I, I feel fortunate that I personally have not. I think that the children and, and of course the teachers are so appreciative of our time when we go into the schools that um, they uh, are very receptive to the presentation and the message. Okay, one here. What was your grandfather's feeling about Austria when he returned to visit so many years after the war? So it was not the first time he had been back um, to, to Europe and to Austria. We decided to take him at that point, um, you know, in his, in his mid 90s. Um, and the reason for the trip, this was after my grandpa, my grandmother rather had passed away. The reason for the trip, actually my dad had a conference there and we decided to make a whole trip out of it. And, and at the time I mentioned his mother, Yanka, died in childbirth when he was very young. When my family had visited Vienna on a previous trip and gone to the cemetery to visit the tombstones, they realized that Yanka's tombstone was completely um, covered over in moss and cracked and sort of hidden. And my dad really came up with this idea to do, to get a new tombstone and do a new ceremony at the, um, for, for Yanka, a new, you know, rededication of, of her gravesite. So that was sort of the meaning of it. And I, and we did see his dad's grave when we were there at that cemetery. We did go back to the street he grew up on, as I said. Um, for the most part, he was pretty positive about it. He was all, you know, liked seeing places he remembered. He still knew German, knew how to read German, liked reading the German newspaper. Um, I actually asked him, because I recently went back to that tape I did asking him reflections of the trip, you know, do you feel hostility? Do you feel still anger, uh, you know, with people in Austria? And, and his answer was no because he, he didn't, you know, really hold grudges like that. He, it was just sort of the person he was. And um, 
So and there were we did go to the several Holocaust memorials, as I mentioned, and you could see he would get a little more emotional. There's one exhibit in an area of Vienna, and I'm not going to tell this story that all the exact details I don't remember, but it's it's a it's a statue of a, a Jewish man scrubbing the streets, and there's an audio part of it, this exhibit, where you can hear the Austrians people laughing. So the, who were these Jews who perhaps came from nice homes and nice apartments and families and all of a sudden they were being forced to scrub the streets and everyone else was pointing at them, the non-Jews pointing at them and laughing. And so you heard this audio next to this statue of the guys uh, you know, scrubbing the street and he said, yeah, he remembered scenes like that. When was the first time you learned that your grandparents were Holocaust survivors and what was your reaction? Um, I can't remember exactly the first time, but I will say because my grandfather was so vocal, my dad has also always been very vocal about my grandpa's story, my grandparents' story rather, um, has also done a number of speaking engagements on it that it just sort of seemed like part of our family history. And I welcome Julie to chime in on this as well. You know, I know from a young age, I, I was interviewing my grandpa and so was Julie's brother, David, a very long time ago for book reports for school. I mean, literally for history classes in, in elementary school, I would put together a report, you know, asking him about his experiences. So the, certainly the storytelling of it started a long time ago. Julie, do you want to, do you remember specifically when it was that you first? It seems like it was always, you know, again, as you mentioned, our grandmother had a lot of difficulty sharing and was very emotional and just was more closed of sharing that experience. Um, just for all the horrors and, and terrible situations she experienced, but he was just always very open about it. I think the number on his arm was always a you know, point of interest in a child just kind of asking um, innocently what that was. So as we got older, there was more and more details being shared. But it's, you know, again, through going through even doing this program and putting together the stories in a, in a way that's not just hearing it in bits and pieces as you spend time with someone over the years was really a wonderful kind of study in understanding his experience. One thing I wanted to say too, Stacy, that you were mentioning just his outlook and his way about him. Um, you know, a well-known book is uh, Victor Frankl's Man's Search for Meaning. And as I read that book once, I just thought that was him. He just had this wonderful spirit about him and didn't carry the weight. He had a lot of introspection and a lot of um, stories to share and a lot of meaning to think through and, and want to impart upon others but um, really that positive outlook, tomorrow's gonna be a better day. And um, you know, that's again, and so he was able to share and I think really hopefully make a difference in, in sharing and speaking with other groups of people over the years. This is always a, oh, this, no. is, this is always a big question. And uh, it came up actually on last week's uh, panel, but we didn't get a chance to answer it, but how, how have you or how do you plan to introduce your grandparents' stories to your own children? Again, this is one where I'm going to defer to Julie in a moment. My, my children are quite young. They're four and a half and almost one. So a little too young to talk about this yet. As I showed in one of the photos, my older uh, child, Noah, did get to meet Grandpa Otto. And he remembers him still. Um, I think... Noah was about two when he passed away, but he still remembers him because we have such fond memories of going down to Florida to see Grandpa Otto, to see Julie and her family, to see Julie's mom, Janet. And, um, you know, I, I think some at some point in elementary school when the kids start to learn about history, and I don't even remember, you know, when that is, that um, we'll start to bring this in. And I think it's amazing because we're really lucky. We have such sort of a, a, a rich box of, of history. I mean, we have video, we have these audio clips we discovered, we have photos, all these documents we've put together where I think we'll, we'll be able to really explain to them or at least have, you know, the means to explain to them in a compelling way. And, you know, by, by then, sadly, there could be no survivors left by the time I start telling my kids, but I'm going to hand this to Julie for a second because she has young teenagers in her house. And so I'm curious because I don't really know, you know, how you started to introduce, say, Eli or, or Rebecca to their stories. Yeah. 
So I have a 15 year old, a 13 year old and a nine year old. And it was probably, you know, our, our grandfather passed only two years ago, actually um, three days before we were leaving for Israel for my son's bar mitzvah. And we had the wonderful um, blessing of doing the rehearsal with him. And, you know, so there was a lot of wonderful connection for the kids and spending time with him over the years. Um, and again, I think the story kind of evolved a little bit organically um, as most do, I probably shielded it from my first child in, in more detail. Um, and my third child probably learned it much younger, just being a third child than, than others might have. Um, so it was really knowing his spirit and I think having the contrast of uh, knowing what he experienced. And then as it did come in through school, they've engaged a lot more just to learn more. Um, and you know, my, my son just this year did a whole unit on the um, deniers. And in Florida, we're, we're fortunate too that we were one of the states that has a Holocaust education mandate. So it's very relevant and um, you know, coming up in a lot of ways. I, I'll finish with this, but my, they, our grandfather, when he was in solitary confinement for a year, had two books because he had worked at a book binder. And one of the books was Homer's The Odyssey. So he read that book over and over and over again for that full year. And my son and daughter actually happened to both be reading that this year in school. So, you know, a difficult book to get through and just kind of one of those connect points of really thinking about what he was experiencing. Stacy, there's a specific question here. Well, it's uh, more just to, to share with you, but please tell Stacy that she and her parents are welcome to join the families of Feldenfing Displaced Persons Camp, which is as interesting. I'd like to join too. Um, that that uh, was started over two years ago, and there are 248 members who share photos and stories. So, um, not a question, but a very yeah, wonderful. that's that's interesting because that was you know as you had said they were in, in Feldafing, and I think it's interesting um, is you know that yes, um, the more you talk about the stories, the more you meet other people, and you didn't realize that their family had this history as well, and how these stories really can connect us even further. Um, there have been a number of times when I've mentioned my grandpa on social media, or even after he died, and, and a really nice obituary ran of him in the Newsday newspaper, where total strangers reached out to me and said, I remembered your grandpa from such and such, or I had this in common with your family, and so forth. And so um, it's been, uh, amazing how we've been able to make connections still to this day after they're gone through their stories. Stacy, thank you again for speaking tonight and sharing your grandfather's story. And Julie, thank you for being part of our program. Thank you again to everybody out there who are joining us. We're glad you took the time to hear Stacy speak words that must never be forgotten. If you haven't made a gift to support our educational programs, we hope you'll consider making one now. Please refer to the chat for ways you can donate. Thank you. Also, very important here, if you have any connections with educators who may want our speakers to present to their classes, please be in touch with us. We now have over 300 speakers. We can do it virtually and hopefully in person soon. Um, don't let, you know, this uh, spring semester go by without getting, you know, a teacher to have a speaker in their classroom. And it can be just like you saw Stacy do tonight and many more different ones like it. We hope to see you again soon. We have some great virtual events coming up, including more We Do Wednesdays on February 17th and March 3rd. Have a good night, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in.